Welcome to the Take 92 Podcast. My name is Sammy Warmhands. I am your host. And today I have a very special episode. Going to take you through my old band, Judo Pony. All right. I've got our singer-songwriter, Jason Johnson. And we're going to talk about the new album, Paper Mountains, we've been working on for a decade. The album that broke up the band. It's a great story and a great album. I can't wait to share it. This is Judo Pony. Hello, hello. Hey, look at you. You're all fancy, man. You got the whole, everything's all set up. Yes, sir. I've been waiting for this. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know. Oh, God. This year has been just, like, outrageous. So. Well, we both knew each other, I would say, as acquaintances. You know, we weren't that familiar with each other back then, other than we had shared the stage a couple times. Yep. And that was probably... I don't know, 2004 ish. And then a few years later, I'm getting to see you more often when I was working at Guitar Center. Yep. And I remember one day, just the stars aligned kind of moment where I see you and we're just bullshitting about guitars. And I was like, you know, what, what have you been up to, man? Like, because I, I knew Speed Shift wasn't really around anymore, yep. your, your old band. And I was like, have you been writing songs? You're always in here buying gear. Like, you know, what, what's going on? And you're like, yeah, actually, I just recorded a bunch of new demos. Would you like to hear it? And I was like, yeah. And, and you had a CDR that you had been listening to yourself in the yeah. car. And you just walked yeah. outside, grabbed it, and like, yeah, here you go. Let me know what you think. I was like, oh, yeah. that's cool. You know, like as, as a, a creator, like I'm, I've always got the CDR of my rough mixes of what I'm doing. And I was like, wow, he just gave me that. That was really cool. Um, what do you remember about the, the starting to write these songs on what was that 2009 demo tape, basically? Yeah, going back to like the Speed Shift era when we had played a couple shows together and we knew each other through the scene for a while, that band basically just kind of dissolved after a period of time. We got signed to a record label out of Portland called Arc Records that was a small indie label. We took the recordings that we had already invested you know, a lot of time and energy into up to a different studio that the record label you know, wanted us to go add a few more tracks and maybe just spice up a, little, a few drum parts. Well, during that whole window, the record label fell apart. And, oh. um, and this was the second record deal I had had at, at that point. So I had kind of been through, you know, the ringer, but this, this time the second go around, you know, we owned all of our music. It was really just, you know, getting a very small label and the intent was to use them for distribution. It was going to be basically like a distribution type of a, you know, record deal, but they were going to invest some money into this um, album. In the midst of all of that, the record label basically goes under as most all, you know, did from that point on but it was kind of at the end of the indie label kind of era and the transition into you know you, you mentioning that it was a cdr like i don't even listen to cds anymore right this was before mp3s i couldn't even just send you something it was like okay here's the actual disc so when that label went under everything all of the work we put in got basically held hostage in the studio we were a bunch of broke guys that were you know in our you know early mid-20s and didn't have any money and it got stuck there. I remember at one point I traded a Telecaster to the studio owner just to get the tracks back out, right? You wow. know, he was like, you know, you don't have any money and they owe us money, but you seem like a nice guy, so here's the telly and uh, here's your stuff back, which I thought was kind of shitty. But wow. Anyways, uh, yeah, this is leading up to the, or the moment when you and I met. I basically, Speed Ship, you know, kind of just disintegrated at that point because all the momentum was lost. One of my good friends, Dylan, you know, he had moved to Salem. He was the guitar player in the band, and he kind of became disenfranchised with everything as well. And so it just kind of, things kind of just ended. So I remember laying in bed one of those nights like we all have had, especially folks that write music or that are creative. And I remember having this vision in my mind of, like, what a new project would look like. And I've always, you know, going back to, like, my roots, I grew up with my grandparents listening to, like, Hank Snow and Hank Williams Sr. and all the, you know, old school country. So I always had this kind of, like, love for kind of a, a bit of, like, a country Americana music. And then as I was going through, like, my transition through my, you know, younger years, I used to listen to a lot of, like, Uncle Tupelo and Jayhawks and all of these kind of alt country, no depression type bands. And so... And just for context... 
so anybody who doesn't know, so Speed Shift was very much a pop punk band. Um, yes. And so th- this is a total shift for you at the time. Total shift, yep. We were like, uh, you know, Foo Fighters meets MXPX, uh, no effects, you know, some pop punk, all that fun stuff. And so, yeah, it was definitely in my mind, I felt that I was feeling a bit more mature in my songwriting and started to think about, like, what would this look like? One with all these, you know, influences that I'd never really played in ter- or written in terms of music. It always had just been rock and roll, right? Just, you know, 4 4 and just go get it. So I started to think through this stuff and like I had the vision of this album that we're going to discuss today that's been yeah. making for you know way too long. But I just had this kind of sound in my head, right? There was pedal steel and there was, you know, horns and there was, you know, all of these layers. And so I literally did not sleep that entire night, woke up the next morning. and I was like, it's time to get to work and start putting these songs into demo form, right? Yeah. So when you and I ran into each other at Guitar Center... I had literally just plugged my Telecaster into my one of my amps and hashed out the guitar parts and then did the vocals on top of it. And it was really just one guitar and vocals, and that was basically a no harmonies. Well, and, so, and I remember but, hearing that thinking that it was already unique because of that, because a lot of songs that are in that stripped-down form, especially in some of the genres that you're flirting with here, that would have been an acoustic demo, right? But the fact yeah. that it was an electric, and it sounded like a small, you were really into the low wattage amps that got a little bit of breakup on, I had a little grit to it, and and so it already just had a uniqueness to it that really just caught my ear right away. And you were talking about how stripped down it was and how there's nothing there. I found myself just instantly singing along because they were so catchy and there was so much room in the songs because they're just great, great melodies with really, really simple chords. And so I would be driving. I remember driving around on my old SUV at the time. I can picture myself coming down the Chambers Bridge and onto River Road back into the neighborhood singing the harmonies on these songs and just being like, man, this is so fucking good. Like, I wonder if he has a band. You know, like, I, yeah. I wonder, like, what is this going to be? And yeah. I think I called you on the phone after that. It was, like, one of the first times that we actually kind of just spoke as two people outside of a show or outside of the store, you know. And, yeah. I, and I was just like, hey, do you have a lineup here? Because if there's some way I can be involved, like, these songs are fucking great. Yeah, no, I remember that phone call. It's funny because back then, you know, none of us really text much everything seems to be communicated through text now but well you guys made fun of me i think it was you and the original drummer remind me his name i can't remember if dan tried to play for a little while i think it might have been dan anyway at the beginning because we're talking about the phone call the beginning around this time when we were talking about doing it serious i was like yo i do have this main project that takes up all my time right and i was in the illusionist we were doing the rap live band thing and I was like, why don't you guys come out to the Wild Hall show? We'll hang out. We'll talk. You'll see what I'm up to right now. And you guys were giving me shit about not having an iPhone. Because <laughs> <laughs> back then I still had like the flip phone or whatever. And um, I was like, what? No, I don't want to text. Like, just fucking tell me what you want. Just call me. On the, you know, and I just very like set in my ways. I would not do it. So uh, yeah. that, that's what popped into my head when you <laughs> talked about that I called you. But anyway, back to the call. I think it was Dan, my brother-in-law, who was in Speed Shift for years. He eventually became my brother-in-law. When we played in Speed Shift, he was just my buddy. And then yeah. eventually he married my sister. So I think he'd, we did one rehearsal with him and tried it out. And Dan just basically said, like, I don't have it in me. I'm not, my chops aren't up. I don't, you know, we hadn't played for quite some time. And, you know, Dan's a great drummer, but a totally different style of drumming. And so that's when you called and said what can we do and i'm like well i don't have anybody yet and you're like well how about a bass player and i'm like that sounds great yeah and then you helped you know obviously connect me with ben because you guys work in guitar center well and yeah i never met ben before i fucking asked ben because he was such a great drummer he is such a great drummer but he was still in college and he was part of like the the marching band at the u of o yeah. and he was just like a super disciplined player like really really good but between his job and the school and everything, when I came to him, I said, hey, um, well, I want you to listen to a little bit of this and tell me if you get any ideas of like who I should ask to join the group. 
<laughs> and he listens to it and he's like, so you're not asking me to try out? <laughs> it's like, yeah. oh shit, you would want, to, uh, yeah, I would, of course yeah. I would rather have you, but like, I just trusted your recommendation. He's like, no, I, I would love to do something other than the marching band. And yeah. he's like, this shit's really cool. And, and so I, I still remember those early rehearsals and, and just kind of watching the songs come to life just as a three piece for the first time. Yeah. That's when I first got the, the space down and where Blair Alley is now. Right. That was remember it used to be just photography studio, like a jewelry studio. And then they, because the real estate market was down so poorly because of the recession that was happening, you know, we were able to get that spot for 500 bucks a month. Right. So yeah. we, had, we had this huge space right down the middle of the Whitaker. And I remember going through kind of our first few rehearsals. And once Dan, had left after that first bit and it was you know you me and ben i remember just like the first couple sessions i'm like yeah we got this with the rhythm <laughs> sections here and this feels good yeah like and going home she, going wow like what is happening right now this is yeah they just came together yeah and it was i think part of it was that the types of songs that they were at the time when we were putting this stuff together you know the framework was pretty well baked and so it was more you know you guys taking the demos and putting your emotion and performances into building it out because you know it went from this stripped down acoustic style type demo to a legitimate rock and roll band at that point you know i just remembered something i think we missed a step here i think before i called you i had recorded my bass and my harmonies to your solo <laughs> tracks <laughs> nice oh yeah and given that to you like hey tell me what you think of this and if I could be of any use to you yeah. where I actually like layered shit on top of those solo demos. I forgot all about that until just now. I, yeah, I did too. I remember that. I, I mean, we're talking at this point that we're going back 10 years, right? I mean, yeah, this was 2009. Yeah. So over 10 years. So yeah, I remember just feeling like, okay, we've got you know something here. This feels good. You know, I had played a lot of shows and you had played a lot of shows in town. So we knew booking shows was going to be easy. We just needed to get everything put together. And that's when we brought Keith in because I remember thinking I needed a, I wanted a, a second guitar player. And I knew Keith through my buddy Isaac and we had seen a lot of shows together and I knew he played guitar and Isaac was like, you know, you should probably talk to Keith because he's, you know, kind of a quirky, funky kind of guitar player and he's kind of an eccentric personality. He might fit in with, you know, what uh, oftentimes for my songs can be, I wouldn't say vanilla, but they can be a bit, you know, in a box, right? I have like a framework of how I want to write something and sometimes it's harder to get out of it or come up with different ideas that don't fit just with the, the rhythm guitar and the vocals and the harmonies and that type of stuff. So Keith was a guy that, you know, came in and, you know, was adding some cool textures and did some cool stuff for a while. And that's when we started recording the demo. I know you had the studio and I think we were going to do that. And then well, we, we did. Ended up I think it was only like four or five songs to start and it was just you, me and Ben and we did all the basic tracks and we hadn't done the vocals yet. And this was like right when he was like trying out and trying to come up with his parts. And I remember being super bummed because at the time I was like, wow, this is, this is some of the best sounding shit I've come up with in here. Like, this is really cool. And right then was like a pivot where, I mean, it was a project where none of us had quite done this fusion of styles, right? But it very much had roots in like the pop punk and alternative worlds we had come from. Yeah. And so when Keith joined, as far as I'm aware, he never even heard the shit. But I remember him getting really tight with you. And then I felt like kind of cut out and my shit got thrown away. And I was like, wait, what? just happened i don't even know who this guy is and like i was really stoked and then my hard drive crashed and those tracks are gone forever actually um so <laughs> yeah. i don't well, even know I what do they sound like yeah i do remember um getting through a bunch of the rhythm tracks in your studio recording and we never yeah i never did the vocals and then so another big bit of background with keith is so i knew him through isaac and i knew him through kind of the music scene but he also owned and ran a studio for many years like a commercial studio called velvet uh velvet lounge i think was the name of it uh -huh. so you know i met him originally um going out with 
to go out to do some recording with him with Speed Shift. And so his brother-in-law, Richard Swift, who is a really well-known in certain circles, right? A well, like nationally released recording artist. And he worked out of that studio as well. He, they were actually all from Cottage Grove and he had this really cool, like almost like a barn, but it was all finished and it was this really cool, like funky studio. And Richard Swift did all of his stuff in that studio. So I knew Keith from the recording stuff. So when he came in and was like, okay, let's start playing. He basically convinced me immediately, you know, why are you recording at Sam's? Let's record this and I'll help you record it. Right. He was like, I'll produce this. I'll, so that's when we started to convert very lightly the rehearsal space into a, rec- a, a studio. Yeah. And we had that recording rack mount computer and we started doing all the work on it with the intention of Keith, you know, pr- finishing it, mixing it, master all the stuff that he had done in the past. Right. Yep. So yeah, to, to your point, all the work you and- did <laughs> was gone <laughs> at that point. Well, but then the big twist of, Keith doesn't stick around very long at all. <laughs> no. No, we played, like, during that window, we had some of our best shows when we played the Battle of the Bands thing. Oh, the Battle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, we, you know, we played some really cool shows. We had really great turnouts, played the Wow Hall, had all that momentum. And, yeah, and then it was shortly thereafter that Keith kind of just started to disappear. And then we were stuck in limbo because Keith kind of just checked out. I got to the point where I was just kind of tired of what was going on with that whole situation. I was just like, you know, he didn't say he was quitting, but I basically said, you know. We couldn't get him to show up. Yeah. And so then the problem was that he had all of those tracks at his house on this rack mount computer because he took the whole thing to his house. Because remember, he he didn't want to record with us at the studio. He wanted to record all of his guitar tracks at his house. Okay. Well, in his apartment. We were waiting and waiting and waiting, and eventually he gave us like one track, and it, I think it was, um, I want to say it was Bowie, and I heard it, and I was like, uh, you know, hopefully Keith doesn't hear this, I don't want to like offend him, but I'm like, dude, I could have recorded that myself, like this is what we've been waiting for, and so then Keith and I, which we're, you know, friends now, I don't see him very often, but we're, everything's good, but we had a full falling out at that point because I was just so frustrated with all the progress that we had lost and all the things that had happened. And so at that point, I don't think you, you kind of were just like, whatever you guys are going to do, do it. Tell me when it's done. And then I realized during that window that actually Ben was a really good engineer. Yeah. He didn't have a ton of experience, but he was really good at it. And so at that point, you know, he had aspirations of working in a studio and I have had aspirations of, you know, starting a studio. So it seemed like a perfect fit. So then everything slowed down again because I had to fully remodel and build out the the whole studio. Yeah. and, And in that middle period, when Keith is gone and then you were right, because once I got sort of vetoed, you know, as a producer, then I was like, all right, well, I'm just the player here. I'm not going to force my influence if it's not wanted, you know? And so I did sort of take a back seat. But then when Keith left, once again, I was like, I know a guy. And for a brief time, we got Ben Polanski on yeah. lead guitar. He was barely in the band at all. I don't even know if we played shows with him, but... We played one one show at the Speakeasy, and he played with us that one show, and it was kind of half baked in terms of parts but you know he was a very talented guitar player but But, the important thing about ben's time in the band has nothing to do with his playing at all it is that he listened to because by then we had done practically a full length here we had done like four or five songs but with keith at the practice space we recorded most of the set we basically were just like, okay, we need to add some lead guitars and some harmonies, you know? And so we showed it to Ben, like, what do you think, you know, you think you could bring to the table here? And your guy's version of the record was much, much slower and prettier. And we kind of removed a lot of the edge from it and the distortion from it. And Ben listened to it and he's like, I've seen you guys play. Like, this doesn't sound like your band. <laughs> right, yeah. I think that was sort of the catalyst of, well, shit, we've got the talent, we have the space. And we had the studio at that point. And, and yeah. Exactly. And then you had been working on converting everything and, and basically the death of the second recording of the album was kind of the birth of Fusion Bomb Studio. Yep. And also, Keith is a salesman at heart and he you know sold us a bill of goods at the time and so 
we were stuck, you know, and we, so when you lose all that momentum, part of the reason why I built the studio out and Ben and I started doing all that also was just out of frustration. Because yes. There was like months where we couldn't do anything. You know, we couldn't get parts done because Keith wasn't recording them. And then eventually, yes, Ben was in it and he heard it. And we were like, this is, doesn't really sound because we were, we were recording that into, I want to say Cubase. And I want to say we were running through Ben's, like, I think it was an M audio, like, interface that was it was all very like prosumer stuff right and it sounded good but like it didn't sound as good as the stuff we did in your studio and then well and and more importantly just the vibe was a 180 i mean i this record that everyone's going to hear that was about two and a half years after we started Mm -hmm. it started in the end of 2011 and so we're playing shows you know we're building a name like we're really coming up with some cool shit together right Mm -hmm. but then between the whole like Keith taking over the record and then also the changing of the direction. I think that was when you and I would start to have disagreements over, well, we've played this song 50 times this way. Oh, but now I want to do like the remix and we're going to perform it this way tomorrow. And I'm like, wait, what the fuck? Like I felt like what, you know, needed to happen was we had this sort of blend and we'll talk about the set list, you know, as we get to the record, but we had these songs that are more rock songs Mm -hmm. that a lot of the early stuff was. And then as we went on, it incorporated more and more of the sort of finger style vibes and, and different tempos and dynamic ranges. Right. And that was great. I loved all the songs, but we kept trying to change the old songs to be more like the new songs. And then that's when you and I would butt heads in the, in rehearsal. Yeah. Well, and part of the problem, or not problem, part of the dynamic was that at that time I was writing new songs while we were going through that whole window, right? So yeah. A bunch of the songs that, like, I'm looking at the original demo. So we had Bowie on there, Born Sick, The Devil's Work. We never we played it live. You know. Back oh in the wow. Day. I forgot that about that song. Yeah. King of the Islands, that was another one we never, yeah, yeah. never made the cut. Learning to Let Go was another one. That was the, damn it, damn it. You know, oh, yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. That was like our yeah. closing song live in the beginning, like because it was high yeah. energy. And they were definitely, to your point before, they were more rooted in rock because that's what we all knew. You know? yeah. So it was definitely a heavier set. Promise Land was on this and Silhouettes, um, Summer, but like, tell me your secrets wasn't on there. Um, we didn't do under the bed uh, where we started. Like half of the original demo, yeah, wasn't even in what's the album that we landed on that we're talking about today. So yeah, yeah. it was all of these just interpersonal relationship dynamics and life changing things because I would at that point I actually was unemployed for a period of time and so I invested all this time and money into the studio thinking I could maybe make a go of it you know Keith was in and out and second record version yada yada and then all of a sudden it was like I had all of these things to write new songs about too because it was a bit tumultuous going through all that yeah stuff. So, yeah so then eventually it landed to the point where the studio was done we had done a couple records already Ben and I had in the studio so we already you know big the paint a little bit in in the studio and then we all just came to an understanding of we have better gear now we've got a bigger space we have more control and we know more of what we're doing and i remember you saying you know like look if we're going to do this this is how we're going to do it we're going to record all of the rhythm tracks live you and ben we're going to do those live i was going to do a scratch guitar and we're going to do those start to finish and whatever else happens with this album as you guys build it out you're like i'm done with this you guys, can, <laughs> you guys you know finish it and, and you're like and we're good and that really was the foundation of the album which is in my opinion you know totally rock solid right yeah and doing that live and getting you know everything set up so and the only thing i'll add to that is i think that there was a defining moment in that conversation we said we're gonna do this as a three-piece and yeah. We know what works on stage. We know these songs through and through. We need to capture that energy and then build on that, you know? Because yep. I knew you had other things you wanted to do to it and add leads and other layers and stuff. But I was like, you know, it. the three of us is the band, though. It's kind of like when I play in Dead Fucking Serious. It's just me and Kellen. We're just two people. Yep. You know, when we go on tour, we'll find a bass player. We'll We'll figure it out, you know? But, like, that record just needed to be the three of us, and it needed to have 
that backbone because the second time we recorded it, it didn't have the live energy. And the first time we recorded it, it was too much of like a normal rock alternative record. And so I think really just trying to capture the live energy and all of us playing at the same time, that was the key to making this feel so good. Yep, agree. And that was what ultimately led to a foundation that allowed Ben and I to build this stuff out, right? So, you know, so everyone listening understands we've spent probably two or three days recording the permanent drum tracks, permanent bass tracks, and then shortly thereafter, permanent rhythm tracks for everything. So what you just described, you know, the three piece. And then from that point forward, we never played another show live that we had another (laughs) guitar player. Yeah, that's, that's my fault. I mean, we, well, I guess we did play a couple times after that. I know because we did the Whitaker block party. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But what happened at that time was I had just quit my job and I was about to go on the, I quit my job for this tour with the illusionists. And and that was a big, big turning point in my life. So I was like, all right, guys, I'm going to give you my focus up until I'm gone, right? But then I I really have to do this. And so it was like, all right, if we're going to do this a third time, we're going to do it fucking good. <laughs> yeah. I'm not fucking around. Let's do it for real. Yeah. And and we got the best sounding tracks. I remember taking, because my Ampeg rig is so big and heavy that I wouldn't bring it to our shows. And I had that smaller one the, from Acoustic Brand yeah. that I dialed in to get sounding almost identical. And I got so many compliments on my bass tone at, at our shows. And I loved that because I'm not really a bass player. And, and so I was, you taught me to be a bass player that I carried to Jory and the Push and that I carried to my solo records and DFS. But like yeah. to drive home my <laughs> tangent, I remember that I wanted the, authentic, the authenticity to go as far as I didn't want to just bring my studio rig because a part of our sound was the sort of solid state compression of the other yeah. rig. And so yeah, this is the first and only time I've ever done this where I had two bass stacks all yeah. mic'd up. I think we had four mics going on. And Ben's DW kit had all the mics around the room and everything. And, and we just went all in. And I listened to the album again today. And you can just hear the fucking room, you know, on some of those more driving mid-tempo rock songs you listen to like in a while or yeah. silhouettes and you just hear the snare ring out in that room you know just the amount of detail we went to try to capture that feel it's felt in the final mix all these years later you know like again that was september 2011 yeah. and i'm just so grateful that we took all those measures going into it and we're like no we're gonna do it right this time there's not gonna be a fourth try <laughs> you know? no, hell no. yeah and i had just invested you know tens of thousands of dollars in gear and so we had good mics and we had really good preamps and we had you know, i bought a brand new audio uh, ad converter and we had a new mac and all the stuff right so we had everything we needed but part of the reason why i built that studio the, when i did was that there was some there was magic in that room like yeah. that live room the, just the, the shape of the walls the construction it being inside of it, another structure and just the way that that thing you know worked there was you know we recorded eventually over the course of time you know 30 or more albums in there and you could just literally set up the mics and it would it, like drums would sound amazing it's those high amazing. ceilings man yeah, high ceilings, and there weren't any square walls. Everything was, yep. you know, the only, only square walls was just the, the divider that we built between, you know, the two sides. But we built that diffuser on the back when you, you recorded your bass stuff inside of the of the control room. Yep. And then Ben had that, all, that full room to himself. So, yeah, there was definitely a lot of magic that happened just to get the foundation for it. And so then what ended up happening, I know we've got a lot of years to cover, but a lot of this is kind of just... <laughs> you know, I mean, it's uh, great. I think this is just a fascinating backstory for the of all my albums. This is a great story. So let's let's yeah. do it. You know. Well, there you go. So what ended up happening is we we tr- we tracked it and everything was great. So for any anybody listening to the podcast that's in the Eugene area, Blair Alley, you know the the bar adult arcade that's, yeah. that everyone knows now. This is fun to talk about, right? So I I built that studio and at the time, like I mentioned before, it was just there was a photography studio. 
and there was a little jewelry, like somebody blowing glass up in the front corner, and it was just like an artistic kind of area that that folks were in. And there's right? nothing. I mean, it was down by the train tracks. There was yeah. like half of the street lights didn't work. It's by the mission. Yeah. Nobody okay. went down there. Yeah. And, and and now it's all and, fucking neon signs, and, and it's, well, dude, it's and happened. So what's, what's even crazier is that we had um, some Nkasi was in our backyard. I know you don't drink, you know, Nkasi, but, like, I remember when we first were in that space, I remember they had just a little small section of the across the alley, Blair Alley there, yeah. in their buildings. They had just moved out of, like, a storage unit, and they were getting a you know strong traction locally and then nationally so when we i we first started this whole thing i remember you know we, we had keys to the, to the the tasting room and it was like you know four kegs that a, a dude ran during the day and we would just you know like we it was just so chill at that time and so while we were building out the studio and doing all the stuff we kind of just talked about this journey and Kasi was also growing and building also they eventually bought that whole building and the one across the street yeah, and then eventually across the street. And every, dude, yeah. yeah. So the Blair Alley part of it, the, the, what we all know of Blair Alley now, which is a super cool spot. That um, fucking killed me, though. I hate those guys. <laughs> oh, I know. Dude, yeah. yeah super bummer. I put all this money in into this building, and there was no, no indication anywhere that it wouldn't be what it had been for you know, 15, 20 years, right? Yeah. So all of a sudden, one day, I remember you know, walking out of the studio to go to the bathroom. And there was a hallway that you remember that was right there up front. And all of a sudden there's like 10 vintage arcade games game machines. Yeah. And, and I remember hearing like through the wall, like, you know, pole position. So I'm like, what the hell? So I go outside and, you know, I remember them wheeling them in and setting them up and they're like, I'm like, what's going on here? Like, Oh, you know, we got a friend of ours and he has an arcade collection and you know, we thought it'd be fun. We can just hang out with our friends. Right. Well, and we're like, we're recording home. acoustic shit in the next room. We can hear you like, yeah. stop hammering the games. <laughs> yeah. Which is when I ended up building off the second isolation room, mostly to <laughs> for the sound. Right? But it would come through the ceiling too. I remember that. Luckily, it didn't. We never picked anything up on a recording, but like, yeah, there were times when like I had the gold motors in there, and well, I guess back up that little bit of arcade area. It went from a couple dudes in the you know photography studio playing video games for fun yeah. to on the weekends it was packed with people. Yeah, like it was bring bring your own beer. People had court box full of quarters, and you, you couldn't even get through the hallway because everyone's like, "Hell yeah, here we are." Well, that then eventually led to... And it was a fucking out. hallway, too. Because it, it, they, they wasn't in the photo studio at that time. It was just a little-ass hallway full of shit and full of people. And so it's like, we're doing a session. Like, all right, I got to run out and take a piss. We'll do another take, all right? The magic's happening. Let's do it. And I run out there, yeah. and there's like a line to the bathroom. I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck? Who are these people? Yeah. Oh, and I didn't know any of them. Like, I knew everybody at the studio, the you know, photography studio. But yeah. and eventually what ended up happening was they realized they had something, right? So they convinced the owners of the building that they leased from to invest in building out what became the first phase of that bar. So the hallway then wrapped into the what was the photography studio. Yep. They built what, the bar that's there now. And all that they've just brought in, instead of having 10 in the hallway, they brought in, you know, 100 uh, old school video games and it was it was super cool i remember having you know like without a poet recorded and the gold motors who's the base it was uh the bass player from the daddies was in that band uh dan jones and the squids was like the lead singer and they it was like an all-star kind of band from eugene and they were like dude this is the best studio in town what the hell that you like we can walk out the door we can go play video games you know get a couple drinks and come back in and i'm like well in are you guys worried about the noise They're like eh, who cares i mean in theory it's great it, yeah. it it was almost perfect, and then it's like, oh, they kicked out the little pottery studio guys, and we're next. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, that was that was the, uh, the the demise of that whole thing. So, what ended up happening from the time that we finished all of the tr the, the core you know three piece tracks is that we were working in the studio. We were getting a lot of people through, not only people that were recording, but people that had heard about the space and wanted to just be in there. So fuck, I, I had, had a show had, there. Oh yeah, that's right. It was a solo show. It wasn't the illusionist. Right? It, it was an illusionist without the band. Cause we used to tour without the band, but we needed a local spot for that tour. So yeah, yeah. We even did a rap show in there. Yeah, that was fun. And you had all the, a bunch of folks from guitar center come out. Um, so yeah, basically what that opened up to is we had now this beautifully recorded, 
you know the foundation of of the album that we're gonna that's gonna be released soon, and that opened up the door for when I said I had this vision of what the band would sound like and what the, what it was going to be, and I couldn't sleep that that night years before all this happened. Yeah. Well, now I, I had the ability to not only record without having to pay money for a studio time, right? Yeah. I had all of these musicians coming through the studio that would hear the album and go, hey, can I play on this thing? Well, like, just like I did. Yeah. We had guys like Craig Chi, like a world-renowned ukulele player that's that's recording on this track. We had multiple guitar players doing multiple leads. We had horn sections. We had Ben had all his connections with the Green Garter Ben at the U of O. So we, at one point we had a four-piece horn section and then later a, a, a trumpet and a separate sax. It was like two kids in a candy store and we were just continuing to add layers to this album, right? Which eventually did pay off, but it took a lot of time and you were, you, you know, at that time you were still waiting for us to get it finished we're like yeah we're getting close we're getting close we're almost there right? well yeah and basically i technically if anyone wants to blame someone and i'm sure that everyone knows this if you followed the band at the time but i killed the band because i was the one who went on that tour and it was six weeks long it's 40 days and i yeah. came back and it hadn't changed at all nothing was done and i was like wait what the fuck are really like all you yeah. got to do is just sing the songs and then we'll get somebody to do the solos <laughs> like what are you talking about and so i was like oh no it's gonna happen again like we're yeah. we're gonna not finish the record again yep. and i from the first time i heard them have been in love with these songs and that last version that we recorded was so good it was kind of like when you're friends with an addict and you gotta be like no dude you can't come home you know, you you got to find your own place to stay. You got to figure this shit out. You know, you got to take care of yourself, buddy, and then yeah, I'll be here for you, right? Boundaries. I've never, I don't know if I've ever done this with a band before, but I was like, all right, I didn't quit the band. I said, I will not play. I will not perform until, you know, you guys just finish the record. Yeah. The, the way I work is so quickly in the studio here. I didn't think that that was going to be a whole thing that lasted you know, the rest of the decade. <laughs> I did not really anticipate that at all. I was just like, all right, I'm out until you guys do that, and then we'll play shows, we'll put it out, we'll go on tour. I remember thinking that I was investing all this money into The Illusionist and into Take 92, and I thought, but when this judo record drops, we're going to make some money off of this. Because like, we were, we were packing shows, the songs were so good, and they're so accessible and just universal. And I was like, man, this shit is going to take off. And I was like, it's fine if nobody listens to this, but man, the judo one is going to pay for these other records when we get this thing out. And then we just never played again. It just it took so many years of tinkering, and Ben would record some of my projects over at his place, I'd be like, so what's going on? Is this going to come out? You know, it's like three or four years later. And, yeah. and he's like, oh, we had a whole uh, horn section in the other day. I'm like, horn section for what fucking song? You know, like <laughs> we're, a th yeah. we're a three piece band, you know? And so like yeah. every time I'd come by, I was like, oh yeah, now we've got this um, pedal steel thing going on. I was like, okay. Every conversation years apart would be like, so is it coming out yet? Like the rough mixes were awesome in 2013 and it'd be yeah. like, oh no, uh, he wants to do this other thing. I'm like, dude, just play the songs you wrote. Put it out, please. Yeah. That's when we <laughs> kind of uh, just unofficially dissolved over that period. Well, yeah. So in another key moment of this, and that's why I brought up the whole arcade piece of it, is that we were you know, 90... 5% complete the stuff that you know Ben and I talked about this is these are the things we wanted to add things like the pedal steel because you know Chris Ross came through and his band Hot for Chocolate recorded an album and Ben and I were like dude we'd love this we Chris is awesome Chris plays pedal steel like we got to have him on the album and I love this one of my in, in my mind when I thought how this thing should sound there was always pedal steel in it right yeah I didn't know any pedal steel player all of a sudden it's like well Chris wants to play on the album so you know, we got through all of that, and, and that was a, a couple of years worth of time for sure. And, you know, I'm trying to survive 
by trying to make money in the studio. Ben's trying to survive a bit because he's honing his chops in the studio. And well, also, and by then, you know, a, I got him a job with me again. So we had went from having a previous day job to then having another day job. And so we started recording some shit together and I would, he was kind of my, my source. I'd be like, Hey, yeah. you got any news from me, buddy? You got any leads? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Well, so yeah, and it was definitely, um, I wouldn't say dragging a feet cause I, I felt confident that whole time. Like, okay, it was worth all of this, this, these years worth of extra work because it's going to sound the way it should sound right and then the studio i get a notice from blair alley the bar now at this point and and it's basically you got six months we're tearing the walls down and this is we're expanding into your studio and i was crushed right because yeah if you think about what's going on right now like music in general is an emotional thing for me and i have a hard time reaching what i feel is like i wouldn't say perfection but like what it should be right my, the standards for where i think the recording or the music should be is, is very high in my mind. And that's just an internal struggle that I have, but I felt confident during that whole time. But I was also going through a window of, I was unemployed. I put all this money in the studio. We had made good traction. The album's 95 plus percent done. We're almost, all we got to do is like two, a lead part and something else. Right. And then I get a notice that, okay, the game over. And yeah. I'm like, what? And so that was, crushing for me and you know because not only was it financially difficult it was also emotionally difficult because i knew that i was going to have to tear this studio down right and so i had to go into a different mindset at that point because i had to figure out if i was going to continue the studio where was i going to do it how am i going to get all the gear just all this stuff man so i ended up like we found a little spot over in kind of west eugene that was just like an empty hole and you know shell and i was going to build the studio out again and it just so happened that we found some guys that were had a studio called a toast studios and it was already built out that's so, ben ordonez yeah and i didn't know the guys but we ultimately ended up just you know it was an easier thing to just split rent move gear in combine gear but it never felt the same right ben was at that point you know very much kind of over and also sad and frustrated about everything that happened, having to move the studio because yeah. it was a lot of work for him. And then when we finally got things dialed in and the equipment's working properly and we're like, we're kind of right there. Well, then my good friend Joel McCombs, who we play in Redneck Mother, the cover band I'm in now, he was in a band called the Johnson Unit for years. It was also just a cover band. But yeah, huh. Joel and I were the original record deal I ever had with 40 Save One years ago. Joel was the guitar player from that band we're talking going gotcha. back 20 years right? yeah yeah so i knew joel joel is a great guitar player and at that time we hadn't even started up with this redneck mother project that was just like for fun because we i was you know judo wasn't playing and so joel came in recorded a few parts in the studio and then another life-changing event happened is that i basically i took a job at Symantec and i had to go to work right and yeah. so i dude it was a long period of time of knowing that i wasn't making any money in the studio I owed rent, right? I'm still, and I've got a new career change. At that point, didn't have a lot of money in general. I'm trading gear out, like stuff that I had invested money in to cover rent, you know, just to basically make it all work until the, eventually it was like, I can't do this anymore. There was no other money coming in. We, we, we never got any new traction for like projects to come record with Ben and I. Yeah. And so that's when I, it just, I just folded the whole thing. And that was another big blow because, you know, we were, were, again, almost there, but we just didn't get it done. And then we didn't have a studio anymore. So then it was, you know, how are we going to do this? And so shortly thereafter, Ben moved back to the Bay Area where his family's from and everything really just kind of sat and I didn't know what to do. Ben was busy and I couldn't really get any, I, and I didn't expect him to, but I, I, we couldn't really get anywhere with what was needed to be finished. It was it was enough that needed to be done that if we would have released it the way that it was, it would have been off, right? We, there's just a couple missing parts. But also, we had done so much tracking, like charity, that yeah. we had 60 to 80 tracks on that thing and, yeah. and layers of horns, right? So fast forward to last year, I knew you wanted to get this thing done for years and years, and I'm sad and frustrated about the whole thing. I was like, Ben, I'm going to fly you up. You're going to come stay with me. We're going to set up a makeshift studio. 
we're going to clean it up and get it finished. Yeah. And so Ben spent a full week. You came over, listened to some stuff. You got your background the tracks finished. And basically we got everything done, right? I was waiting on yeah. one guitar part that Jim Prey finished. And you, you know, you obviously heard that when I sent over the kind of the rough mix of it after he had recorded it, I had met Jim through, you know, just we play music, whatever. And then we got it done. That was a great time because I mean, you talk about the studio closing, Ben moving away, you having a huge career change. And in all these years, I'm the other guy. I mean, I did 17 tours in that period of time. I dropped almost that many albums probably in that many, you know, in those years. And anytime I'd hear some little whiff or I'd run into you or something, like, oh, hey, what's going on? And you'd be like, oh, dude, I just got one more thing. And it was always just like, oh, just one more thing, you know. And so I just couldn't understand this. Well, if there's only one more thing, and it was only one more thing two years ago, like, you know, and so when we finally all got in the same room again, even though it was just a room in your house, I was like, wow, this shit's sounding good. It's (laughs) actually coming. Well, and another thing I'm remembering now, because I had threatened on a couple occasions, I have rough mixes that are like (laughs) seven years old. You know, You're like I'm gonna release this shit. You I'm gonna pu- to I'm gonna put this out. You know, yeah. I'm just gonna drop it. But the only reason I didn't is because I was missing songs, and so I couldn't get away with it. So when we finally got together, and we got to listen to everything, you know, everyone kind of just putting in their two cents as you do on final mixes. It was really, really cool to see that come together. And and you know, we had made a couple records recently around that time. Yeah. Um, before he left, and so, you know, we had a good working relationship in the studio, and and he would send me stuff or play me like, hey, this isn't working. Tell me what is, you know, like you do this all the time. I haven't done this in a while. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah just do A, B, and C, and he'd try that. I'm like, oh shit. And so even though I wasn't there a lot, I really felt a good connection with Ben in terms of like, I didn't mix the record, but I had enough good input on it that I feel. Like I had a say in the outcome and, 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 you know, it's got characteristics of the way I produce, even though I wasn't always in the room. And, um, yeah. you know, I really think it sounds like all of us, you know, it sounds like everyone in the yeah, band. For sure. To your point about, you know, the number of albums you created and put out and released and you know, recorded since, you know, the beginning of the story that we started an hour ago, a couple different things. One, you have a different mentality on how you approach recording, right? You're much more structured. You're much more have workflows that are built out. Yeah. Um, all of the stuff that we were doing, Ben and I, we didn't know what we were doing either. I just knew that Ben was a really, really good engineer. It, it, whatever I wanted tone wise or mix wise in my head, Ben could do it. Like, and it yep. would just communicate in a way that was just a really back and forth made sense. So I felt really comfortable with Ben. And so both of us during that window, when the studio was still open before the Blair Alley takeover, you know, that was a really creative, fun time because we were working on other people's music, but we were also working on our music. And it didn't feel for either of us at that time that we were, you know, that we should be speeding anything up or we should be just finishing it and just getting it out, right? We didn't, in our minds, we were thinking, Nobody's pushing us to get this thing done besides Sam at that point. The well, not well, yeah, because I'm thinking like, dude, we're killing it. It shows like, give these people some shit to buy. Like, they would love it. This would take off, you know, like, let's go on tour. And, and I just, I yeah, I, I couldn't see it. Yeah, <clears throat> and I agree with you. But in terms of like my personal life and financially, again, with putting all this money into the studio and trying to make a go of it, it was the same concept of you selling your Xterra, buying a tour van and you know, quitting your job and hitting the road. Right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I didn't hit the road. I hit the studio. And yeah. part of surviving during that time was getting people in. So I would spend a lot of time going to shows on the weekends and meeting guys like Robert Mead and all the folks that eventually came through and recorded it because part of what I had to do was go see the shows, introduce myself, and then get them to come record. Right? Well, and that's just, what Thaddeus did so expertly in the early 2000s. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah, everybody recorded in Sprout City, and that was what he did. So I yep. was just, I was enjoying being out and being at shows and meeting new people and doing all the stuff. It was the same idea, right? So the immediacy of need to get the, you know, the album out. You were fully invested in your new journey. The band, you had 
made it clear that we weren't going to play a show until we got the album done. Yeah. And so I just said, I'm on my journey now too in the studio. And so, you know, but we'll get there soon. And I had no idea that it could, you know, within a couple of years without <laughs> with all that time that everything would just collapse. Right. Yeah. We don't think these things through because it's like, how in the hell would anybody think that that place that you saw the first day we were in that studio, yep. that eventually there would be an arcade bar outside of it. Like that no yeah. one would ever think this, you know what I mean? Yeah, dude, like, my fucking parents took me to a comedy show there, like, you know, l last year. I mean, it, it's it's a trip going down there. You know, it's like when you go to, we used to play a ton of shows at John Henry's, you know, and then now you walk by and it's this, like, really kind of nice-looking sports bar, you know, and it's well-lit and it's new and, and it's just, like, trying to envision the dingy-ass piss floor, you know, crooked room that we used to play in and just pack 150 people into um yeah. it's a trip going into uh the blair neighborhood at all now because that whole block looks different oh dude it's uh fully ninkasi corporatized at this point yeah but anybody who goes into anyone listening to this that goes into blair alley if you look on the floor in the middle of where the dance floor basically is you can still see the line on the concrete of where the walls were I mean, really basically yeah, they just they just tore it down. And you can still see it. I mean, that was all rough. And it, and then I went from the studio, studio closing, opening a new studio, starting a new career. And then that was when, once I started at Symantec on a personal level. So that would have been back in like 2012. I spent I basically devoted myself to building this career, right? And yeah. so I went from you know doing inside sales to inside sales management to an outside sales career. I saw my earnings, you know, just explode because I'm working for a corporation now. I'm not, you know, yeah. I'm not working for myself. I'm not working for, you know, someone locally in Eugene or we all this stuff that I was doing before. And so, you know, the door opened up to this whole new world. And so, and that took a lot of time and energy. So all of that was happening. Ben moved back to the Bay area and everything just kind of died. Right. And I've come to realize that I'm the type of guy that even though like right now I have a small studio at my house with all my amps and guitars and I've got some nice recording gear now and I've got, you know, in theory can be recording. I don't really function that well unless I'm collaborating, right? I don't, yeah. I'm not good at just like you are, right? Where you're like, I have this idea, I have this stuff and you'll, you have the discipline, you'll go in and you'll get it done. I'm like, Where's the guys at? We need yeah. to, you know, set the drums yeah. up in the base. Like that's that's how I work. I'm just old. Like I'm gonna buy one of these, um, those machine Mark III, like a drum machine, but it's also samples. Yeah, yeah. Stuff. My friend Danny uses that when we tour together. Yeah. yeah, I've seen folks use it live, and I've heard it's you know cool. And I'm gonna force myself to try and figure out how to create rhythmic textures within it that I can record with because I not having a studio and not having drum set up and not you and I working together in real life is really hindering for me. So what ends up happening is it's a lot of me recording songs on my phone and going, Hey Sam, what do you think about this song? Yeah. <laughs> just, well, you know? Something I did because lockdown, you know, we can't get the band together for DFS and Kellen is essential when it comes to the arrangement of the song and so we record it the same night that we learn it and that's the demo that we like use as the jump off you know it's like all right cool now we've got something that sounds like us right yeah. since we can't do that now i've been writing songs for dfs and i literally took like a 58 pointed it at my chest and i would i would i would drum on my chest and then i put drum triggers over it oh, nice. so like, it would sound it out, yeah. so it would sound like a fucking drummer and i was like this sounds so weird there's no cymbals and so i set up my hi-hats and i just played quarter notes on the hi-hats i'm yeah. like this actually sounds like a passable drum kit right now and um i'm taking that and then sending them to uh a friend of mine in la who's gonna then record proper drums to it so like yeah. th this whole lockdown version of songwriting i get is very hard when you're fully alone and you're trying to make rock songs it's really hard and the other part of it for me it's the collaboration piece live right well all the stuff that we did with that album yep when we first got together yeah that's the foundation for it. i'm just old school where you know my wheelhouse is writing songs and then getting people together and doing it yeah and i haven't had a studio now for 
six years, yeah. you know, five, six years or so. And then I also started, because we weren't, do, you were busy with all your stuff. The studio was defunct at that point. I was just regrouping. We moved back to Junction City and I was like, you know, at Bugsy's. And I just remember watching a cover band play and I'm like, what the hell is this, man? Like I could start a cover band in 10 seconds and pack this joint out, you know, just in my mind. Yeah. I'm like this way. So I text Joel, you want to start a cover band? Yep, and I'd never in my life played in a cover band. I actually typically always like turned my nose at it because I just thought, you know, write your own songs, come on. Yeah. But in my mind, I thought, and the Winter Gibbs was a guy, we wanted to start a band called the Pinky Swears, and it was going to be um, kind of a me first in the Gimme Gimme's version where we would cover you know, just a bunch of obscure songs and we would put our signature on it, right? Well, that was kind of what shifted into this Redneck Mother thing, Was I and Redneck Mother was like a tongue-in-cheek name from an old Ray Wiley Hubbard song that was this nonsensical version of like what we think of as of this redneck right and being raised by his mother raised him well right he's out kicking hippies asses and raising hell you know this was just some nonsensical idea and what we were going to do is do some like southern rock covers do you know some soul do some modern rock food fighters but do kind of my version of it when i say mine just because my vocals are coming through and arrangements are oftentimes the way that i would do it well so ben played in that band for many years right that was the funny thing too is that like basically so two-thirds of judo splits off to start playing covers that sound sort of like judo <laughs> and yeah. i mean i was touring a lot so don't get me wrong but i was doing that to sell the records versus you guys are all about the live element and yeah. i'm going i mean my whole process is make the record play yeah. play shows to sell the record and then make a new record. And so I'm, yep. I, I mean, that, that was part of my reason for being so obstinate with, you know, not playing because it was like, well, I'm in this to make the album. I want this in my collection, you know, like yeah. I'm not just doing this to play bar shows till the end of time. And so, yeah. so then we both split off and I focus on making records and you guys focus on just playing shows, you know? Yeah. Well, and it was it crazy is this idea of like, I'll start a cover band in my mind thinking to myself this cover band i'm watching right now sucks ass I'm yeah like, we started the thing up and then dude we are packing and like, we're playing big shows with judah playing we're talking playing you know for 300 plus people on a regular basis like people yeah. at the door trying to get in and all we're doing is covering songs that people like you know what i mean so it was really fun and then well, we're still well covid we're not playing in shows but the band redneck mother's still playing and it has been a fun thing with all of the stuff that's happened recently with like the Black Lives Matter thing, the social movement trying to figure out this equity of the racial movement in America, the redneck name has kind of like turned me off. You know, it was supposed to be tongue in cheek, but it did yeah. transition into kind of like a, you know, we're playing some country songs and we're getting a lot of like, you know, kind of rednecks coming out to our shows. Yeah. I tell the guys the other day, I'm like, I'm not down with the whole redneck mother name. It was totally fine before, but it's now kind of. It's just not my jam at this point. So I mean, Dixie Chicks so, just changed to the Chicks, so uh, you guys are yeah. next, I guess. Yeah, so we'll figure that. But yeah, independent of all that stuff, that's kind of good for us to catch up on the journey and where we kind of landed on it. So ultimately, what ended up transpiring is you know Ben came out, we got all the stuff dialed in to the point where the all the mixes were where they should be. We finally got that last guitar part for Summer at the Bead that Jim played. And then we hooked up with Thaddeus, who's been in the music scene for years and years. I never actually recorded at Sprout City, but I've, you know, know tons of people who did and I've, you know, two bucks short and all of my friends back in the day, he put out lots of great albums. And then you told me like Thaddeus has a whole new mastering set up. You should yeah. check in with him. So yeah. he got a hold of it and I don't know about you, but when I heard the first mastered, you know, for people that don't record, when you're recording, you know, and even though you have mixes that are done, the sheen and the compression and all the things that make it sound very dynamic are not there. So the, the best way to describe it, it sounds a bit flat, right? It's a cake with no frosting. That's what it is. It's just the last yeah. touch, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So when I, I just remember hearing, and this was only a few months ago, but hearing Thaddeus's mastering job that he did on this thing, and I just went was like, whoa. Dude, yes, all of this work, all of these years, all of this, you know, everything we just talked about, it was all worth it because this sounds better than I even thought that it was going to sound. You know, but when I heard it and I was listening to it with a bunch of my friends around a campfire, 
it was playing on a little Bluetooth speaker, and I'm like, if it sounds this good on a Bluetooth speaker, just <laughs> it's going to sound freaking amazing. So yeah. I got super excited about it, and then you know now we've just had a few months worth of nonsense because of COVID, but we're ready to get out. So fast forward to today, we've set a release date. Yes. October 30th. And this is going to come out just a couple days before that. Yes. And so, um, I, I, so everything is uploaded for the digital distribution. I don't know if I told you this, but I just in a roundabout way started a record label that I released a bunch of the speed shift stuff on, and I'm going to release the 48 one stuff and the judo pony, just fusion bomb records. So I have fusion bomb records kind of set up nothing formal, but it, Ultimately, everything is going to be on Apple Music. Every streaming service you've got, we've got um, hard CD copies that will be coming within the next couple of weeks. Everything is submitted. Release date is set for the 30th. And then the pre-release or the pre-purchase like purchase date, I set it for, I think, the 23rd, a week before. So it's official. It's uploaded. I couldn't stop it's happening. it if I wanted to, Sam. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> Short of me, I yeah, hacking into DistroKid's uh, you know infrastructure and deleting files, it's ready to go. Well, on that note, I would like to talk about the songs themselves a little bit because yeah. this has been such a long time in the making. Man, I listened to it again today, and you know I've been saying to my inner circle for a long time, I was like, I'm telling you, one of my top five albums I've ever made has not come out yet and and uh man you guys are gonna love it but it's not here someday i hope you'll get to hear it you know and and actually a good catalyst for this too is in january my dad was in the hospital in the icu the whole time and and was in really really bad shape and when i was down there this is a guy who bought me my first boom box when i was two my mom yelled at him he's two years old he doesn't need that thing you know, when I'm in middle school, uh, he's given me some of his stereo equipment. He's helping me build up, you know, as I'm getting into bands and stuff. He's helping me yeah. do that, you know. He named me after a rock star, Sammy Hagar. You know, uh, th- this is a guy who has had some direction in the musical influence of my life, and yet he doesn't come out to see me. He doesn't listen to my <laughs> records. You know, if I tell him yeah. I put something out, he doesn't say, oh, can I hear it? Yeah the last shows that he ever would consistently come to were ours. He's yeah. in the hospital January 2020 and he asks me about Judo Pony. And I was like, no shit. And I, I had just witnessed some traumatic shit there and I thought he was going to die, you know, right then and there. And I, I came to you and was like, get me this now. Give yeah. me this now. Like, he actually fucking wants a thing? And so I remember yeah. getting all the rough mixes or whatever. Or no, no, they were the final mixes, I think. Yeah, pre-mastered, but yeah, yeah, yeah. everything was complete other than the one guitar part. Yeah. yeah, and so I took this hodgepodge together. We didn't have the final sequencing or anything, and I burned that and, like, brought it to him on, like, a portable CD player in the hospital so he could have it, oh, that's you cool. know. That got us talking again, and then we got it mastered. So, yeah. fun little, almost sad anecdote that kind of got us back in gear again but so the record begins and ends with sort of a six eight shuffle um yep. i thought it was important to try to keep the live set list to some extent and mm-hmm. and again give people just a sense of what this band was like in our day and born sick was one of those first demos that didn't sound like any of the other songs and yet it was the perfect intro in some way, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, going back to when I wrote that song now, you know, years and years ago, it was to set the kind of framework for my songwriting. Like, I never forced myself to write a song. There, you know, songs, to me, have to come from an organic, interpersonal expression, right? And most, or a lot of the songs that I write come from a place of, like, maybe sadness or like emotional, I wouldn't say negative, but you're feeling a sense of kind of sad movement within myself. You know, some of the songs that, that are on the album you know, are definitely more uplifting or more positive, but like every single song that I write, I, my theory is if it doesn't move me, it can't move somebody else. Right. And yeah. if the goal as a songwriter, as a musician or as an artist is to make a connection with other human beings and have them feel what you felt if you didn't feel 
moved, then it's not worth writing, in my opinion, you know? Yeah. And so I think every song on this album, because, you know, as we talked earlier, there's a bunch of other songs we could have put on it. I think it was the appropriate and the right songs that all captured as best as I could as a songwriter, those feelings, right? Yeah. So Born Sick is, you know, I wrote that song kind of in a low moment in my life. And it was this whole idea, the opening line, let's say I stop breathing, you know, my heart takes its last tick, right? This idea of what if this moment was the last moment, something happened or, you know, you get sick, like your dad, you describe things happen in life all the time that are just so unexpected. And so what do you do? And so then I started to kind of think through what a bit of life looked like in that moment and kind of the metaphors in my mind of what we're all trying to do. And that whole concept of, I guess I'm born sick was this idea that I wouldn't call it like, you know, religious sin, but this idea that we're all born a bit broken. Right. Yeah. And so how do we get through this thing? And so the, you know, the chorus on that is, I think Kamar and I were having a bit of a rough moment at that time. And I just was thinking to myself, I feel like I'm losing you and you're the only thing I've done. Right. Yeah. You know, how do you capture that? Right. And that set the foundation. That was one of the first songs that I wrote for that project. And so it's kind of cool that when I asked you, like, what do you think the order should be that you put that first? Yeah. Because that was kind of the beginning foundation for every other song that I wrote. And then the end of it, Charity, to your point, kind of similar type songs. Yeah. That's a song that is written kind of about redemption, right? The idea that, you know, while we all are broken in whatever way that is, everyone has their demons they're fighting and the battles that they're struggling with. At the end of it, the album kind of finishes with this notion of, you know, there isn't anything that we could do that would remove us from like the concept of like grace and redemption and, you know, all of these different kind of themes that run through the album. Yeah. It lands with this kind of like positive version, not trying to be spiritual about it, but it was kind of like an amazing grace type song, right? Which I think is universal to everyone, whether you are spiritual or believe in a higher power, you don't. I think it's universal to humans for that striving for working through the struggle and then eventually landing on acceptance and kind of the grace that either you give yourself or that you get from other people around you, right? So then it trails off into, and this is the fun part with the horns, <laughs> Yeah. Know, what is it, four minutes worth of, you know, what I could always call the SNL outro. I always had <laughs> yeah. in my mind, like, yeah that song would eventually get to, you know, when they're rolling the credits, you know, for Saturday Night Live and they've got all their killer horn players and guitar players that are just slaying yeah. dragons, but they're all kind of playing over each other, you know, and that's how the song kind of ends. So it and also, in my mind, just kind of captured a lot of the indulgence that we, you know, Ben and I put into this album, like yeah. self-indulgence and musical indulgence. It was like, yeah, we've got way too much happening, but it all kind of ends with, this outro that is kind of like roll the credits, you know? So I call it, it the kitchen sink outro. Yeah. Dude, we spent so much time editing that down because when Ben was at my house during that week, we talked about this last year, trying to get it you know, finished. We both looked at each other like, do you even remember this part? Like where, <laughs> where, where did that one come from? Why do we have four trumpet parts right here? And what were they doing? So we had to listen through every single track. Dude, yeah. It was like paint by numbers to basically take, a screen's worth of horn parts and then basically map them out into sections that made sense for what part was played and how we were going to mix that stuff together. And it was, yeah. And before I get, I mean, we're long in this, but dude, this project couldn't have happened without Ben. ben oh, yes. Yeah. He's, he's the secret weapon, the unsung hero. I mean, th talking about making sense of those tracks, I mean, a lot of these, the sessions were gone. So he had to take and import all these fucking files and then make sense of that. He did so much work that, I mean, we've talked about why I got burned out, but, I mean, Ben did so much more <laughs> work on this record. Yeah. Um, oh, dude, and, and a big part of it is that Ben is brilliant in so many ways, but he also was the only person that was capable of bringing all this stuff back together, right? Which yeah. is why I said, I mean, I, I love the guy and I want to you know, hang out with him all the time, but I'm like, I'm going to get you on a plane, yeah. <laughs> get you down here, I'm going to feed you, <laughs> I'm going to clothe you, and we're going to work through this. 
stuff. And so aside from being, you know, a brilliant drummer and a brilliant musician, I mean, I working in that studio during that window of time, I saw so many half baked artists, bands, whatever would come through. And when Ben was done just engineering it, right. And, yeah. and the production value that he kind of creatively would build into it, you know, Ben's playing parts on all these albums. Cause he's like, do you care if I add a couple things here? And it would sound nothing like the beginning. And that's the, yeah. to me, the brilliance of what Ben does. And so I wish he was on this podcast with us, but we'll have to just do a follow up after the album's released. And he's like, okay, it's for sure out. And then we can, all, yeah, you know, I texted him today and I was like, yo, we're going to, we're going to talk about it tonight. And, uh, it's going to come out on the 30th. I promise it's happening. So yeah, maybe he'll forgive me once we get to that point. So, but yeah, Ben put in so much work. I'm sure it was, he's told me it was overwhelming at times because, you know, it's like trying to keep track of your kids at an amusement park. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah you're there, but you can't find them. And yeah. Yeah. And I, I would have, I mean, I told him before, like, dude, I would mix it, but like, I wasn't there and you have all the raw shit. You're the only one who can do it, you know? Well, and he had the hard drive that had all the data on it in California. So that was yeah. another just big limitation. And it's so crazy how fast. 10 years goes by. <laughs> yeah. Like, think about that. Yeah. Like blink of an eye. I mean, it, in one sense, like so many things have happened and so many things have changed and everyone's grown in different ways. But like, it seems like it was yesterday. We were starting the first part of this project and now we're there. So, well, and to continue on the, the songs here, we have another couple more, you know, up tempo rock tracks. I think that, sequencing is really important to me. It's something I always think about. And the track two choice is very important. I think of an album like Ill Communication by the Beastie Boys. It opens with Sure Shot, which was a yep. single. It's a great Mike Pass and hip hop song. But then track two is Tough Guy, a minute and a half hardcore punk song, right? Yep you are telling the listener right out of the gate, like, oh, it's not just all this one thing, you know? Yep. It's throwing an early curveball, and so there's not like you're halfway through the record and going, wait, where are all these hard songs coming from? You know, and, and they found a really brilliant way to do it. And so with this record, Summer, again, being one of the early songs, but also one of those more alternative rock songs from the early set, uh, of those shows and injecting some energy into it, you know, yeah. was really important to me to go up there. And then we come down of it with Promised Land and get even more quiet. But like, I just felt like we got to hit them with something coming right yeah. out to keep it high, you know? Oh, I agree. And it was um, in terms of the track order and then also the work that Thaddeus did making the mastering his kind of imprint on the mastering piece of it, but also how the songs flowed properly, right? They weren't yep. just, we didn't just go two, three seconds between songs, stop, go. Like he really did a good job of making all this stuff just naturally pass the way it should. And that's how we did it live, right? We had transitions yep. we would work through. The thing is, I know you kept saying like, what guitar part are you talking about? What lead are you waiting for on <laughs> yeah, summer? Yeah. And then I think when you heard it, you were like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Like I, something I couldn't <laughs> even play live, but in my head when I wrote that song, we were able to muscle through it and create the energy live because we've got loud amps and loud drums and I can sing loud into a microphone and it didn't have to have that. But on the album, I continually felt until we get this lead line in there it's it doesn't have the energy that it should have you know what i mean yeah and so i think i remember seeing jim playing somewhere around town and i mean this kid is just smokes on the guitar and i was like dude i got a track do you think you can throw something on it and that was him just taking what we already had mixed running through one full take and it just made the song. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. It's a great song in general, in my opinion, but like the people heard it without it, they go, Oh, now that we know that it's there, we'd be like, something's missing. And that's why in my head, I'm like, we got to get this, you know, this part done. So I just wish I was a better guitar player. Cause I could have done this. The other part of the whole thing is that I'm not a great lead player. And so I didn't feel like if I just hashed out these lead parts, like to your kind of, methodology of like well dude you just got two things do it like i'll do it you do it let's go get it done <laughs> and i'm like i i can't do it well <laughs> so. well yes and no because i also really do know my limits and so 
I will bring in someone to play. I mean, I've had Ben play on stuff where I'm the guitar player. And I'll be like, yeah. hey, how about you play this song? Because it's a little more complicated and I like to focus on my singing, you know? And I was like, yeah, yeah sure. So there's nothing wrong with doing that and, and knowing your strengths and your weaknesses. But for me, I was always, I really liked your more textural guitar playing. Like when you do a lead, it kind of reminds me of like how Billy Joe would play. And it's not like noodly leads, it's like textural, like higher dyads and chords and stuff. And I, I always really liked that about your style. And so I'm going like, we have three guitar players in the band. What, what is the thing? <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's the part, you know, but, uh, yeah, but none of us could play what Jim played. You know what I'm saying? Like for that one song, right? None for of sure. Us could do that. For sure. I mean, ben tried multiple times to write a lead and both of us kept going like, no, this is not, this is not going to work. Yeah. Just, you know, Jim's got the chops for it. But yeah. And the other thing too, is like my guitar playing from Judah Pony back then to where it's at now after playing, you know, several years in Red Neck Mother and playing a bunch of other people's songs where I needed to learn new parts and play. It's, it's, you know, everybody grows as musicians. And so I think, you know, I could probably do a much better job now, but that being said, it led us to where we're at today. Right. So I think the songs are still relevant. Oh yeah. Yeah. We weren't writing or playing songs that had a short shelf life. Right. These are, in my opinion, you know, classic, rock and roll, soul, Americana. And yeah. I think there was enough blending of genres that releasing it today versus 10 years ago, or on the 30th versus 10 years ago, I think they're just as relevant, if not more so today, than they were then. And that's a good setup for the third song, which is Promised Land. I mean, of the first batch, that was the standout of a song that just melts you, you know? Yeah. Um you as a songwriter have such a way of really being vulnerable and relatable at the same time. And it just, I mean, there's sort of a gospel quality in the way that you write. And I've always, <laughs> I'm sitting here in my bad religion t-shirt, you know, the atheist guy in the band, but I've always loved that about your writing because you know, good gospel has that heart in it, you know, and you're doing that, but in a more universal way. And I think Promised Land is really just the epitome of that, a song that just gets me every time I hear it. And it's funny because there's minuscule things, you know, at a certain point we had to just be like, just fucking put it out, right? Yeah. And, and listening back to the record today, I was like, wait, why did I sing that last line? That's stupid. That makes the, oh man, I was like, I should have, do the harmonies and the whole chorus part, and then when the music comes down, it rings out for that little beat, and you say to the promised land, I was like, why am I singing that? That We have the big part, and the harmony is pretty, and the extra layers, and then yeah. just sing out for a second, and he says the fucking the hook of the song. God <laughs> damn it. Like, why didn't I think of that all those years we were playing it? But yeah, this song just always hits me, man. Well, yeah, and to your point about like the gospel themes that are kind of strung throughout the album, what you just described about when we say gospel music, I mean, just probably more of like a, you know, Americanized or America's Christian version of, you know, the gospel of yeah. this kind of, you know, thing, you know, which is truly universal to a lot of folks of, you know, a higher power and believing in something outside of ourselves. But one of the things that you just mentioned about like gospel music in general is the best versions of it are very vulnerable right they, yep. they are trying to search your soul right and you're trying to balance off being human and what's beyond me right what's beyond this life or what's beyond whatever and so unfortunately there isn't a lot of great gospel music i personally believe that the vulnerability aspect is removed and it's more about delivering a message yeah. you know and changing someone's mind or capturing someone's heart and i don't think you can ever do that without being vulnerable, right? So like one yeah. of the lines in Promised Land is, they say in God we trust, and I believe it. Mm -hmm. They say his plan is just, I just can't see it, right? Yeah. That's, that was me going like, I don't see God here right now, you know? I believe in, in you know these things, but I don't see him working right now in this moment. And so it's just allowing yourself to work through these different concepts within yourself and the beliefs that you may or may not have, but then eventually to say, I don't even know what I'm doing. I don't even know what I'm doing right now. And that's, song, that's the key because that is the humanity in it. Like you're saying, it's not 
an agenda that you're putting out there or something. It's like the same thing that I get when I'm singing along to Johnny Cash gospel songs or something like that. You know, it's it's got such a human quality to it that we all experience that if I'm not saying a literal prayer, I still get the idea and can relate so much to the words of him asking for help or for forgiveness or whatever it is, you know, yeah. because of, again, the vulnerability. Yeah. Well, I think that was part of, so a good foundation for, you know, born sick, basically kind of the concept of like original sin or like humans being sinful or that whole kind of concept transitioning into summer, which was very much a lighthearted, like, you know, so we could talk about it on the, on this podcast. Song about fucking. Too. Yeah. I, I literally wrote that song about, <laughs> Kamari and I, when we were, you know, early in our relationship, and her, have I ever told you the story? I don't know. Do you have videos, though? <laughs> no, I don't. I mean, back then, we didn't have good cameras on our phone, so, um, <laughs> but no, it was, uh, I, we woke up, and I remember asking her, I was like, kids, your clothes at? kids, turn this off. Yeah, PG. I'm like, where are your clothes at? And she's like, I don't know, you know, some are here, some are there, and like, it, I, I basically had this idea of... You know, this beautiful kind of time, Kamar and I had only been together for, you know, a short period of time. And, you know, we were loved and all this stuff. And I'm like, and it was like, I remember looking out the window and like the sun was shining. You know, it was one of those beautiful, like early summer days and the sun's coming through. And so, you know, that song came out of it. And that was more just, you know, a lighthearted kind of love song for Kamari. And then it transitions into, you know, it gets heavy real fast. <laughs> yeah. Slant, right? Yeah. Yeah. But then I think the rest of the album, as we kind of run through it, it was the same types of themes, but I tried to do write a lot of songs that were themes that were beyond, I was trying to push myself to think beyond my internal struggle and think about what other people are struggling with. Right. So yeah. in a while was a song written about Kamari and I, so we very much again, internal, but eventually we get into songs like Bowie and Hot Mess and John Hughes. And these were songs that I was really moved by the human experience and what other folks were going through to the point where I felt it myself. So it, trying to tell a story of what I felt someone else was going through, if I have this moment to be able to describe it, how can I describe it the best way I possibly could? You well, know, and, and John of, Hughes is a great example of that. I mean, you know, that's one that I even covered myself because I, I just, and it's funny because it's not necessarily one of my favorite ones to play because that's very much just a you song and I'm just yeah. hitting the notes basically in that one. But God, it's just, um, I mean, tell me where that, where that song came from because it, it, the lyric is really, really powerful. Yeah. Well, I, so John Hughes, just as a producer, screenwriter, Director, the guy we know, all these just outrageously. I remember watching Sixteen Candles the first time, you know, when I was probably, you know, six years old at my cousin's house out in Triangle Lake on VHS, and I just remember yeah. feeling a different way than I'd ever felt about watching a movie. And it wasn't even, you know, I, I, I was too young to really understand the themes of it, but the vulnerability that John Hughes was able to portray. And these themes of, you know, adolescent love and loss and all of these, you know, different things, things like The Breakfast Club, right? Well, I was watching, I, I've always had this feeling about John Hughes, and I watched this documentary called Finding John Hughes. It was on Netflix, and I just flipped it on late night one time. And so this documentary is, it was a group of folks that was that wanted to make a film. John Hughes had basically kind of gone into hiding. He was you know, at the peak of his career, was making all of these amazing, you know, movies, and then he just kind of disappeared, and nobody knew what happened, right? It's been a long time since I've seen it, but, like, they started working through, like, well, what happened, and is leading up to this, and where did he go, and, you know, try, they were trying to get interviews with him, but throughout the whole thing, we started getting the sense that John Hughes, at some point, made a decision that he was tired of Hollywood, he was tired of the bureaucracy, or the the economic component of it or whatever that was because you know, we never really heard that so they're just kind of thinking through this and so the lyrics were written in two, two different ways one was my interpretation of what i thought john hughes was going through and why he kind of disappeared right the, yeah i don't have the lyrics in front of me but the whole idea of we're breathing the dust it was like there was a, a moment in the movie where he was talking about like the amount of destruction that has happened in Hollywood to people's personal lives and all of this. And I just kept thinking of like, 
you know, Hollywood falling and all the destruction that occurred and we're all here now left breathing the dust from it, right? So there's all these yeah. different themes. But I also wanted to write in the song that emotion that I felt watching his films growing up, you know, or even as an adult. So like one of the lines is, where did John Hughes go? Don't forget about me. And I sang a line that was in one of his movies and it was just like, how do I tie all this stuff together? And so it was really just a bunch of feelings while watching this documentary. And then, and I wrote it that night after I watched it. Cause I'm like, I gotta write something. What am I yeah. going to do? You know? That's amazing like, because I never took it as so literal. I thought it was like, you know, that line was the extent of the John Hughes part of it. And that it was just like a, it would make sense as a good title. But the yeah. themes are so universal that I didn't really think that it was all about that um, yeah, well, by, you by any about, means. You know, we all feel abandoned like a ship left at sea, right? Yep. I know he didn't write and produce, but like, you know, the Goonies, right? The feeling you felt when you were a kid watching movies like John Hughes wrote and that vulnerability of being young and not knowing how to even think about yourself. Yeah. So it was, it was hard for me to tie everything together properly, but the theme was truly finding John Hughes. Where did John Hughes go? And then finding yourself. Like, like how, how do you find yourself through this, and how do we all feel? And that maybe this is how John Hughes felt, and maybe that's why he disappeared. And the sad part was he eventually just died. Like Nobody knew why he left, and he never did any more interviews, and he just kind of disappeared. And a lot of people speculated he just almost like died of a broken heart, you know, like wow. just yeah, kind of gave up on life because he was just tired of it. So anyways, yeah, that's where John Hughes came from. Well, to keep going through here so I don't tie you up all fucking night, we come out of that with the newest song in uh, the judo set, and that is You Always Wear That Smile. It's in some ways the most straightforward song aside from the quiet intro there's not a lot of like dynamic shifts or change-ups you know we kind of just find that groove and ride it but it's a powerful song i really like the way that guitar just kind of sizzles and comes in and then we yeah. boom and it's oh, yeah. kind of got a like creep vibe the rhythm of it the rhythm section yeah. you know um mm -hmm. But it's a lot bigger, and um, it's almost a little nastier. I, I was that one of the ones you used my VHT on. Yeah, that was. I used the Deliverance, and I used my most all of the songs had the Tennessee Rose in it, the Gretsch. Yeah. Um, but that one was one where we took your VHT head, and I think we had your Mesa cabinet in there, that two twelve. Yeah, I think I left and, all my shit there while I was gone. Yeah, and so we had nothing in the room, but that giant room other than the amp and the guitar. And so the intro is, you know, me in the live room and taking the headstock of the Gretsch and resting it on the VHT. And that was the only song we used the VHT on, um, <laughs> on the whole album. Right. So that intro of that swell of the guitar that leads into the beginning, right after we, the piano part at the beginning, that was just capturing a bunch of room mics in there and getting that deliverance amp getting, you know, all saucy. So it was yeah. fun. I'd like to uh, point out to you that I was playing this today, and have I mentioned I played this today? No, um, <laughs> I feel like I've said that a bunch, but I had this on, and Ange is singing to all the songs, even a song like this, which we played the least amount at shows. Yeah, barely. And uh, she still knows all the words to all these old songs, she does not sing along to my records, um, <laughs> but uh, but but she sings along to our records, so that's that's yeah. nice. I'll take that as a compliment. So yeah. I would, I would. <laughs> yeah, and well, I think one of the things I hear from a lot of feedback from people that hear you know songs that I write is when you say accessible, a lot of the feedback I get is like this familiarity, right? Like that yep. people will say like your songs are they feel familiar to me, even if I haven't heard them before. And then once I hear them, I feel like I've known them for, you know, however long. So yeah, I don't do that on purpose. I think it's, <laughs> it's just your just influences, trying, right? you know? Yeah. Just trying to, yeah. Yeah. And that song in terms of the, the meaning behind that, that was that. So the, the window in time when the studio was closing, mm -hmm. all of the stuff was kind of going on and Kamari and I were moving. 
moving again, right? We had moved a handful of times, just life circumstances. And so the opening line of, you know, the pictures are off the wall in a box. I guess we're moving on. Yeah. That was a song written for Kamari from a place of, am I doing the right thing for you? Am I, you know, because at the end of the day, through every up and down that we ever went through, Kamari, that whole line of, you know, you always wear that smile. That was her constant positivity through all that stuff, you know, and that was when Everly was, you know, she was pregnant with Everly shortly thereafter. And, you know, we had a, a kid who's now 10 years old. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> you know, all these life things are happening. And so I'm happy that song made it on the album because I wrote it like, I think I wrote it maybe like a few months before. Yeah, dude, that was it. an 11th hour edition for sure. Yeah, we dropped Under the Bed for that song because we were like, yeah, Under the Bed's great, but it's not going to, it doesn't, it, it, we needed a bigger song to, to balance out some of the yeah. know, slower stuff. So. Well, and speaking of balance, the outlier from this record is different and new, and mm -hmm. it, it's one of the only songs that couldn't be changed from that original vibe you know there were a handful of rockin' songs on that demo and when we brought them to the band that's how they came out and i remember one of the earliest things that i added were those hits in the intro while you're singing the solo yep. guitar i was like no we can add something here like let's get interesting with the rhythm section you know and it's funny because it, it worked great in the rock set and i'm glad that we kept it particularly just because of the bridge and i think the it's some of the more interesting like bass stuff I get to do from the early songs, but it's definitely out there for these songs. You know, like it's yeah. it still works, but fucking barely. Oh, I hear it. Yeah, it, I think we kept it, and it works because I remember when I wrote that song originally, and I was like, I always have to have some emotional drive. That whole thing I'm talking about, like if it doesn't move me, it doesn't move anyone else, but. At the same time, I also was trying to push myself to write something ch chord structure wise that I wasn't comfortable writing, you know, like I'm very comfortable doing a lot of the, like the promised land stuff and the John Hughes and there's, yeah. you know, these are kind of like easy transition songs. So that one was where I was like, you know, come on, Jason, write something that you feel a little bit uncomfortable doing. So that's probably why it's an outlier is it was, I was trying to push myself into a different version of my songwriting and I loved it after I got down the mic. Yeah, yeah I mean, cool. I, it has things that we don't do. It has dissonance, it has chromatic changes. I mean, it's a cool song, and I'm definitely glad we kept it. But again, some of the reason that we have some of these songs still in there is because it needed to not start out really strong and then be a real slow, sad record, you know? like Because, yeah. I mean, a after this... Time to Breathe, that's another one that I thought could easily be an opener or closer. It's another kind of, got a mini epic quality, not quite like Charity, but it was really unique. And I remember, I think that one came around the time that we were doing the the Battle of the Bands thing. And yep. uh, trying that out live was really fun. I that, that bass line that I get to do, the second bass part in the verse, I was like, whoa, that was a cool thing. And I remember my friend yep. Dan came up to me and he's like yo you only get one lick like that per song that shit was fire i was like oh thanks man yeah that's cool well, i remember you you playing that live you know at the wow hall with the full horn section on stage with us yes just, you know the intro and that yeah it is so that, to this date i have so many people that say when are you going to play judo pony songs again yeah I, you know, since you and i and us haven't been playing i don't I sort of like you know a quick little promised land in between a set or whatever it is yeah. i don't i'm not doing it i have so many people they're like i miss going to judo pony shows and hearing the judo pony set and they're all ready for us to get back out there but yeah i have so many people that reference that particular show and go dude that was like one of the best shows i ever saw you that's know, awesome we had so much energy the place was packed you were on fire we had the horn section, you know, so much fun. And then we lost to, like, a cover band, I think. I don't remember if it was a cover band. No, like, I think it was, like, a quote-unquote metal band, not quite. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway. Yeah. All right, so we talked a little bit about Bowie already. I like that because it's got the kind of everlong groove with the hats. Hot Mess is another one that is sort of the partner to Promised Land. In it, mm -hmm. it came much later, but... 
it was like a sequel that's somehow better than the original. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not the one I think of, but whenever we uh, we played it, it's one of those that you just get like almost like solemn when you hear it. You know, it just the story is so yeah. real and raw. And man, yeah, I just and that was a friend of the band's, uh, Sarah, who we were at the speakeasy, and you know, we happened to be at, at the bar, kind of in between sets or before, or we weren't doing sets, but before we played or after. And she had this, you know, tattoo on her arm, on her forearm. And my buddy Brandon walks over and is kind of, you know, goofing off, and he's like, "Oh, what's the tattoo?" And he like took his fingers and mouthed on, and it was a portrait of a, a child, like a young mm-hmm. child, and kind of moved the mouth with his fingers. If it's hard to describe, like on the skin, like made it talk on the skin. Yeah, like oh. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And I could see immediately she had a very strong, not like offended, but very Just strong emotional reaction. To, uncomfortable, yeah. Brandon kind of walked off, and I was like, "Hey, you know, some of my buddies goofing around, whatever." I'm like, "I could see that bothered you." So I, so I asked her the question, like, "Well, you know, what's the tattoo?" And she did not want to tell me, and she was just very like not closed off because why should she tell me? I'm, I'm yeah. you know, not a stranger, but I'm asking a very personal question. So then she tells me this, you know, extremely sad story of her son passing away from SIDS when she, you know, he was very young, and I like broke my heart in that moment but you know we became friends after and i still communicate with her once in a while but same situation i go home i'm laying there after the show i can't stop thinking about her and losing her son and all the stuff i wrote that song at three o'clock in the morning in my bed all the lyrics for it and then just mapped it out you know to the i always have a melody when i'm writing lyrics but you know the thing came together and 20 minutes in my brain and so that's just that's the beautiful song those are the best songs you know like that was when i was trying to transition and the bowie was another one that lyric wise was about you know a young girl who passed away from cancer yeah that i saw on a tv show it was the uh extreme makeover home edition and it was this story of this beautiful you know vibrant young you know i think she was maybe 10 or 12 years old got cancer she's going to conquer it eventually she ends up passing away and it you know broke my heart wrote the song and then a handful of years later my nephew came down with leukemia he's totally good now so no sad moments here but we went to this place called the hope house because he had cancer the make-a-wish foundation and had different things they would do for kids and so out in pacific city it's this beautiful huge home that sleeps you know 20 people but it's on its own private kind of lake and it's called the hope house and it's children that are battling cancer get to go stay there yeah one of the things they do is they have a a rock that each one of them they put their name on it and so during their stay and they can bring all their family out so i was there my sisters were there my parents were there just you know all there to kind of just be together and celebrate and kind of relieve ourselves from the struggle that he was going through with leukemia so he went out and placed his rock. Well, Kamari and I are out walking, you know, down to the dock where the boat was, and we're just taking a little walk. And as you're walking, it's very solemn because you're seeing all of these rocks that kids have placed. And some of those kids survived, and some of those kids passed away. So you're just very, like, emotionally moved by this. And as I'm walking through, one of the rocks was Bowie. So yeah. she had been at that house because she was lived in Oregon. That's part of the whole kind of oh, connection. Oh, that okay. It was a national show, but she lived in Oregon. So, and I, you know, of course, at that time knew she had already passed. And so it was kind of like this whole full circle thing where I'm like, what are the odds of this happening? My yeah. nephew has cancer. We're here. So, you know, it's very beautiful, but it was a tribute to her, like the tribute of as strong as she was and, and was wanting to change the world that we all have got to do better you know even though she didn't survive it was just like so inspirational to me to write that thing so you know it's sort of like that atari song from back in the day where uh the fan was terminally ill and wrote him a letter and and i remember seeing chris rowe play that song solo at the wow hall right after he wrote it yeah none of us had heard it yet and it just brought the house down. Yeah. It was... Uh, oh, yeah, I, I saw them live at the uh, Medford Armory, of all places. It was them and, I think, Vendetta Red one night for, like, a Halloween show. And, dude, they just slayed it, man. It was so good. Yeah. That song was just a uh, highlight of the show. I'll never forget it. Um, so, before we wrap up, we got a couple more oldies. Ali versus Apollo Creed is a really great relationship song. This was one where I covered maybe 
2012, I think. My parents yeah. were having a hard time, and I recorded this song for them, you know, and, and it was like, yeah. uh, you know, I want to go back to uh, where we started. I don't want to go yeah. back to where we've been, you know. <laughs> like, yeah. I just want to say I'm sorry, and I, I, there's just so much truth in that, and we just celebrated 21 years together. You know, anyone who's been doing it a long time will really feel where you're coming from, you know. Yeah, and that was just, you know, relationship. Kamari and I are running through stuff, and I always tell Kamari, I'm like, there's no such thing as a time machine. Like, if we had time machines, we'd all be millionaires, like, and everything would be great because we could fix all our problems. I'm like, you know, we can't go backwards. we got to go forwards, and, you know. So, yeah, that was just kind of a, one of those moments of turmoil that, you know, a song was created, and Kamari's always like, why do you have to write the sad songs about this? Why don't you write some, uh, <laughs> some happy love songs? I'm like, I'm not good at those. Yeah, I'll same try. here. I only write when I feel like i got to get it off my chest, you know? Yeah. Well, and then Silhouettes is a showstopper. That one was also from the first demo, and I love singing the harmony to it. I love me and Ben just bringing in kind of a quiet groove in the beginning, and just slowly building this up. But most of all, I just love the simplicity of the hook. I am alone. Just repeated. And yeah. it just makes me want to weep every time I hear it, every time I sing it. I remember being on stage and singing it with you and I'd have tears in my eyes. I would look out there and like Mac and the girls working there would come out from the bar and they would have tears in their eyes when they heard it. You know, and that song is just transcendent to me. It, I don't know. I can't say anymore. I'm gushing about it. You tell. Yeah, well, that's the oldest song on the album in terms of you know, when I wrote it. I wrote that song long before I ever even thought of Judo Pony being a project. Really? I wrote that song back when I was in Speed Shift years ago, we never played it live because it was not didn't fit our set. But I wrote that song shortly after my relationship with my ex wife Megan. We got married young and you know, had two beautiful daughters right out of the shoot and I was twenty when we got married and she was nineteen, so it was just, you know, high school girlfriend and yeah. all that stuff. I wrote that song in a moment where you know, I knew that she had kind of moved into a different chapter in her life. And even though I was more of the instigator of kind of the separation, reality kind of hit of what it felt like in that moment. And I, it was like a combination of the emotions you feel about somebody else that you've built a portion of your life with and that you've known. And then you're also now realizing that you're alone, right? Yeah. <laughs> even though we, I have family and friends and all that stuff. A uh, unique part of that relationship back then was that I was very isolated, right? There was a window just out of high school where I only focused on that relationship. I didn't hang out with my friends. I didn't really hang out with my family. It was very tumultuously. had a lot of, you know, just, we just, you know, didn't get along in so many ways, not passing blame on anybody, but it felt it was very isolated. So when that relationship ended, not only was the relationship over, and I was like the first person in my family to get divorced, right? Like yeah. I'm a firm believer in marriage and I'm like, but here's the Jason's getting divorced. So I was very isolated from everyone at that point. So when I wrote that, that was probably the most alone that I'd ever felt in my life. And so I'm you know, reflecting on what's happening in her life and like the whole the silhouettes on the wall is, you know, me having visions of or imagining her with another person and like the intimacy and the new life and all this stuff that's going on. So you're feeling very vulnerable and sad about those types of things. But then you're like, I'm alone. But funny enough, Kamari, her favorite line that I had ever written, she says, is in that song. And I wrote it before I even met her. The final page has turned to the end, end of the, the book. It always had an ending. I just, I simply forgot to look. Yep. You know, when she heard that the first time, she's like, wow, well, that's a great line. But in her and I, in our relationship, We've been together now 16, going on 17 years. She always looks at it as like, okay, well, not only was that a song you wrote, and it was about the relationship that ended before her and I got together, but it was also ultimately the declaration of that the book is closed now, right? And, and yeah. so she loves it. I never even thought about it. I just wrote it. So I always <laughs> yeah. like that line a lot, actually. I, I was going to bring it up, and then you brought it up for me. So shout out to there Kamari. <laughs> Um, so, Shout out to Kamari. So yeah, and then so we come out of the, 
the sad suite there at the end and end with the the charity jam. I just want to tell you, man, uh, you know, for all of the the years and whatever disagreements, man, th- this is a great record. I love your songs. I love you guys. This has just been a privilege to work on and, and to be a part of this band. And I don't know what the fuck the future is going to be of, you know, musicians, period. But like, you know, if this is it, we've got something that we can hold on to forever. And I could play this for my grandmother as much as I could play this for my bandmates playing punk rock and hip hop. And I just love it. And I'm glad to be a part of it. Well, I appreciate that. The feeling is always mutual. And I think, like I said, we've got it, the songs are still relevant, right? Who knows? Like, to your point, are we going to be playing shows ever again? I don't know. I mean, people are playing some shows, but, you know, like the way we used to, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. But I think, in my opinion, there's a bit of a lack of this type of an album kind of in the music world right now. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, there's, it's a lot of solo artists. It's a lot of, when you're talking about just more like rock and roll stuff, there aren't a lot of, you know, organically written band records anymore. And so economically it's hard to do and as we described it's this is years and years of putting all this effort into getting this album to where it eventually landed but i just don't hear a lot of this type of music and i think people miss it you know what i mean i think once it gets released i think people are going to go oh well yeah that's this is kind of rad and we're kind of in one of the saddest years of our entire existence (laughs) right in 2020 yes i'm hoping it's appropriate it will resonate with people given the circumstances of the world in general so yeah we'll see what happens man. well i'm not sure how many eyes are going to be on it but i know anybody who hears it will get something out of it and you know who knows this album being such a mixture of of styles and and years that things were written it's a great first record and you know if everything works out then we can have judo pony part two in 2030 there we go i was gonna say i actually have a, about an album's worth of songs <laughs> In, in the vein of judo pony that are basically i've been writing a bunch of other songs there was a window there i had to write a song about not writing songs so yeah. that was a that was a sad moment in my life because i'm like can i even write songs anymore <laughs> um but yeah to your point in 10 years we might have another album that we can talk about so. yeah so we'll see you guys in 10 years <laughs> that sounds good man all right that is our show again i am so thrilled to finally share this album with people. I've been telling people for so fucking long, oh man, one of the best things I ever made. Let me tell you, it's coming, it's coming. And for a while I thought it was never gonna happen, but I have the final cut. It's gonna come out this Friday. You can stream it everywhere. You can buy it at take92.com. This is the song we were talking about. Cuts you right to the core. It's called Silhouettes.
was killed by a sacred act while the blood it slowly spilled.